Good morning. This is the time and place for the Commission's weekly administrative meeting. We have a hearty agenda before us today. Um, so why don't we get down to, to business. Um, we have meetings, uh, minutes from the, the last meeting. Is there a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I move we uh, adopt the minutes from the administrative meeting of September 19. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? All right. The minutes are approved. Um, do any commissioners have any opening statements for today? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, uh, why don't we start with the consent agenda? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the consent agenda, item number one is Verizon Maryland LLC and Quantum Telecommunications, Inc. filed on August 23, 2018, amendment number one to the interconnection agreement between Verizon Maryland LLC and Quantum Telecommunications, Inc. Item number two is Verizon Maryland LLC and PEG Bandwidth MD LLC filed on August 23, 2018, joint application for approval of an interconnection agreement under Section 252E of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Item three is Network Billing Systems LLC filed on September 4, 2018, re request for approval to de-tariff its retail competitive local exchange tariff, PSC, Maryland number two. Item number four is Cybermark Systems, Inc., DBA, Pro Energy Consultants, filed on August 1, 2018, a request to terminate its current electric supplier license. And item five is Etheridge Partners, LLC, filed on August 1, 2018, a request to terminate its current electric supplier license. Thank you. Do commissioners have any questions on these items? A quick question, if I might, Mr. Chairman, just for my education. Uh, number four, Cybermark has a, it's only $100, but it's, it's, um, it's due to the commission. What happens to that? How's that dis dispositioned, if someone can answer that? Does it just kind of go away? Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Kenneth Albert on behalf of staff. My understanding is that, that we do send those to collections. We've decided to go ahead and process these as terminating their authorization. And then if we can't get some resolution on the penalty to send it to collections rather than holding up. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Seeing uh, no other questions, um, is there a motion for this package of consent items? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for item number one, I move that we approve the amendment to the interconnection agreement 10 days following a 30-day comment period, assuming no adverse comments are submitted. And for item number two, I would move that we approve the interconnection agreement 10 days following a 30-day comment period, assuming no adverse comments are submitted. Uh, for item number three, I'd move we grant the company's request to de-tariff its regulated local exchange services and cancel its PSC Maryland tariff number two. For items number four and five, I'd move that we cancel the company's license to operate as an electric supplier in Maryland. With five motions on the table, is there a second? All in favor? Aye. The five motions are approved. Uh, Madam Secretary, if we could move to the administrative agenda. Yes, Mr. Chairman. On the administrative agenda, item six is Mitel Cloud Services, Inc., filed on May 18, 2018. Joint application of MLN Topco, LTD, Mitel Networks Corporation, and Mitel Cloud Services, Inc., formerly known as Mitel Net Solutions, Inc., for approval of, one, the transfer of control of Mitel Cloud Services, Inc., to MLN Topco Limited, and two, for Mitel Cloud Services, Inc., to participate in certain financing arrangements. And if counsel for any of the parties is present for this transaction, please step forward. Seeing none, Mr. Albert. Good morning again, Chairman, Commissioners. Kenneth Alper for staff. Again, this is an item as a request by Mitel Cloud Services, Inc., which I'll refer to as MCSI, MLN Topco, and Mitel Networks Corporation, which I'll refer to as Mitel, for authorization to the extent required for the transfer of control of MCSI and for MCSI to participate in new financing. The Commission has authorized MCSI to provide resold local exchange telecommunication services in Maryland. They will, as part of this transaction, acquire, MLN, excuse me, will, as part of the transaction, will acquire all the corporate stock of Mitel in an all-cash transaction valued at approximately $2 billion. Mitel and MLN will then form to merge to form a new combined entity named Mitel Networks, ULC, 
at the closing of the acquisition, MCSI will become a wholly owned indirect subsidiary of Topco through several intermediate holding companies. Diagrams depicting this transaction both before and after were attached to the applicant's filing and were attached as well to staff's comments. As explained in staff's comments, commission approval is not required for the acquisition. Staff does believe the acquisition is in the public interest and the financing satisfies the requirements for the exemption or the need for commission approval. Uh, again, staff looked at the financing and it too seems to be in the public interest as well. Therefore, staff recommends that the commission note the acquisition and the financing. Thank you, Mr. Albert. I'm always uh, skeptical of transactions that are effectuated in the Cayman Islands just for the purpose of creating a shell company. Um, in this case, the, the party says, um, acknowledges the transaction arguably requires approval under the code, um, but, but staff is comfortable that the approval is not needed here, just noting the acquisition and financing is sufficient? Yeah, you, Commissioner, uh, often the jargon they'll use is we seek approval to the extent required. Um, you have to sort of go through the jurisdictional buckets, I call them, when you go through uh, 6101. And, you know, e there's all these, it has to, has to fit this one and then has to fit that one and then has to fit that one. And a lot of these transactions get kicked out because there's one, there's one uh, bucket they just don't go into. In this instance, um, the parent of a public service company is deemed under 6101 to be a public service company. So we check that box, but that parent that is the acquirer here, excuse me, that is the target here, my tell, does not operate in Maryland. And statute does say that if the target is a public service company that operates in Maryland, and we read that literally, that the, oftentimes we, we lose the transactional hold because that parent, while it is a deemed public service company, does not on its own behalf have operations in Maryland. So we, we're compelled to just go through each of those categories. But I wouldn't read too much into the way the applicants couch the application in terms of seeking approval to the extent required. I think they're just kind of confused themselves about going. They seem to, you know, I'm always feels like saying to them, why don't you do my work for me? <laughs> you know, why don't you do this? But they, they, let, they leave it up to me. I mean, I think these have not been controversial items, candidly. I mean, even when we do find that we have jurisdiction, they're typically approved. But that, that's the way we handle them. Thank you. Your, your explanation was um, Balsam and satisfied by uh, curiosity. Thank you. Other uh, <coughs> questions? Seeing none, is there a motion for this item? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that uh, we note the acquisition and financing. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Right. The motion is approved. Item number seven is Transbeam Inc. GC Pivotable LLC filed on July 11, 2018. A joint application of Transbeam Inc. and GC Pivotal LLC DBA global capacity for approval to complete a pro forma internal consolidation. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Kenneth Alper for staff. This item addresses the request by Transbeam Inc. and GC Pivotal Global, which I'll refer to as global capacity. They're requesting a commission approval to implement a reorganization sort of in the form of consolidation in which Transbeam will merge into global capacity. In Maryland, the Commission has authorized Transbeam to provide local, tele telecommun local exchange telecommunications services. The Commission has also authorized global capacity to provide local e exchange telecommunications services. As a result of the consolidation, Transbeam will merge into global capacity, and therefore Transbeam will no longer exist as a separate corporate entity. The applicants also request that the Commission terminate Transbeam's authorization to provide local exchange service, effective upon notification that the consolidation has been completed. Staff believes that the applicants have demonstrated that the consolidation is in the public interest, and this fits in the jurisdictional bucket of a public service company that is operating in Maryland, acquiring another public service company. In view of the fact that the result of the consolidation, Transbeam will merge into global capacity, and Transbeam will cease operations, Staff recommends that the Commission grant the request that the Commission terminate Transbeam's authorization to provide local ex exchange service upon notification by the applicants that the consolidation has been completed. However, this termination of Transbeam's authorization will not be effective until the applicants have made a filing that demonstrates that they have satisfied the Commission's requirements under Comar regarding advance notice to customers. 
Therefore, staff recommends that the Commission, one, approve the consolidation, and two, trans uh, terminate Transbeam's authorization to provide local exchange service, effective when the applicants, one, notify the Commission that the consolidation has been completed, and two, demonstrate that the applicants have satisfied the notice requirements. Thank you, Mr. Albert. Are there any questions? Seeing none, is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move the Commission approve the consolidation and terminate Transbeam Inc.'s authorization to provide local exchange service effective when the applicants A, notify the Commission that the consolidation has been completed and B, demonstrate that the applicants have satisfied the Commission's requirements regarding providing advance notice to the Commission and customers. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion is approved. Item number eight is T-Mobile USA, Inc., Sprint Communications Company, LP, filed on July 20, 2018, a notification of indirect transfer of control of Sprint Communications Company, LP, to T-Mobile USA, Inc. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Kenneth Albert on behalf of Telecommunications Mergers in Maryland. Uh, this item addresses a filing by Sprint Communications Company, which I'll refer to as Sprint Communications, and T-Mobile USA that notifies the Commission of a transaction in which T-Mobile USA will acquire indirect ownership of Sprint Communications. Sprint Communications is authorized by the Commission to provide local telecommunications services, and Sprint will merge in, into an indirect subsidiary of T-Mobile, with Sprint surviving as a direct subsidiary of T-Mobile USA. This merger is conditioned upon the approval the receipt of approval for both T-Mobile and Sprint shareholders and the required regulatory and other government approvals, including by the Federal Communications Commission and the United States Department of Justice. Exhibit A to the party's filing does depict both the before and after of the transaction, and we did again attach it to our comments. This, this one was knocked out of jurisdiction by for two reasons. Uh, T-Mobile, which will acquire the Sprint stock, is not a telephone company under the statute. Therefore, it's not a public service company. So that knocked that one out. Uh, second, Sprint Corporation, which is the corporation whose stock will be acquired, I mean, essentially the target, does not operate in Maryland, which is similar to the first item I did. Yet we do believe that the merger is in the public interest. As noted, the merger is conditioned on approval by shareholders and the federal government. Consequently, the staff recommends that the Commission require the applicants to notify the Commission regarding future changes in the status of the merger. Sum up, staff recommends that the Commission, one, note T-Mobile's acquisition of indirect control of Sprint Communications, and two, require the applicants to notify the Commission regarding future changes in the status of the merger. Thank you, Mr. Albert. Obviously, this is a large merger, but we are not the primary venue. Um, I don't have any questions. Do commissioners have questions? Commissioner O'Donnell. Quick question. Uh, Mr. Albert, did staff come across the uh, dollar valuation of this transaction during its review? No, we did not. Not. Sure. I, I imagine it's rather large with a lot of zeros there. Yeah, it's the big players. Thank you. Is there a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, for item number eight, I move we note T-Mobile USA's acquisition of indirect control of Sprint Communications and direct the applicants to notify the Commission regarding future changes in the status of the merger. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion is approved. Uh, the next two items can be taken together. Item 9 is Interactive Energy Group, LLC, filed on October 16, 2017, an application for a license to supply electricity or electric generation services in the state of Maryland. And item 10 is Interactive Energy Group, LLC, filed on October 17, 2017, an application for a license to supply natural gas or natural gas supply services in Maryland. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Kenneth Albert on behalf of staff. This item addresses a request by Interactive Energy Group for authorization to act as, as a broker of electricity and natural gas. Their management team has significant experience in the energy industry. Over the past seven years, Interactive's affiliates have agreed to settlements and enforcement proceedings at several other state regulatory commissions. Settlements addressed allegations that supplier affiliates of Interactive were engaged in improper marketing practices. We did receive information from the applicant about these proceedings. Staff, of course, is concerned whenever there have been enforcement actions against an applicant in another state in which they're operating. However, in resolving the enforcement proceedings, Interactive agreed to approve its program for compliance with marketing standards. Their recent complaint history, we believe, is satisfactory. 
we met with Interactive. They did come in to speak to us. We are satisfied that they have an adequate compliance program. And as a result of that, we are comfortable with recommending approval of Interactive to operate as a broker and a, excuse me, a broker of electricity and natural gas. Representatives from the company are here. Thank you, Mr. Albert. Uh, Council for Interactive Energy. Yeah, good morning. Eric Wallace uh, on behalf of Interactive Energy <coughs> along with Christina Montgomery, uh, who is an employee of Just Energy Group that is the parent company of Interactive Energy. And Just Energy is a, a large company with, with many different retail suppliers and city areas. And in this case, this application is for uh, one of their broker affiliates. Thank you. I noted that the initial application for both the uh, gas and electricity license were filed back almost a year ago in October. You had some subsequent filings up or updates since then. Is there a reason why that is, this has taken almost a year to come before the commission? Yeah, so we had been working with staff to, to schedule a meeting and, and um, to, to discuss some of staff's concerns about the history of the Just Energy side and some of those enforcement proceedings that um, that staff council was just discussing. And so we came, we actually were able to, to meet with them recently and, and came in and, and talked through those issues. Um, and so I think that was the primary course. Okay. Yeah, in fairness, the applicant, your uh, commissioners, they, they were very forthcoming in meeting with us, wanting to chat with us. There were some delays on staff side for that meeting to actually take place. Okay. That was part of the delay. But it did take time, candidly, to get the information about each of the enforcement proceedings. That's always a bit of a challenge. Thank you. Are there additional questions? Is there a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, for items number 9 and 10, I'd move that we grant the company license to operate as an electricity supplier and as a natural gas supplier in Maryland, limited to broker services for the customer classes and service territories applied for and recommended by staff, and that we direct the company to file notice with the commission within 30 days of any changes to information in the application. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Go ahead. Aye. These two motions are approved. Item number 11 is Deep Ellum Power and Gas Company, LLC, filed on July 16, 2018, an application for a license to supply electricity or electric generation services in Maryland. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Kenneth Alp, on behalf of staff. This item addresses a request by Deep Ellum for authorization to operate as a broker and aggregator in Maryland. The management team has significant experience in the energy industry. Their performance in other states has been satisfactory. Therefore, staff recommends the commission authorize Deep LM to operate as a broker of electricity and natural, uh, excuse me, electricity in Maryland for commercial industrial customers. Thank you. Seeing no questions, is there a motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I move we grant the company a license to operate as an electricity supplier in Maryland limited to broker and aggregator services for the customer classes and service territories applied for and recommended by staff. Direct the company to provide marketing and training materials specific to its Maryland operations to the commission staff 30 days prior to utilization of the materials in Maryland. And direct the company to file notice with the commission within 30 days of any changes to the information in the application. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. The motion is approved. Item number 12 is Baltimore Gas and Electric Company filed on August 31, 2018. Supplement number 618 to POC Maryland E2 Retail Electric Service Tariff. The company proposes to update the administrative charge effective October 1, 2018. Good morning, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Commissioners Lloyd Spivak for the Commission staff. This is a filing by BG&E to update its Standard Office Service Administrative Charge. The Standard Office Service Administrative Charge was established through the Commission's approval of the Phase One Settlement Agreement in Case 8908 with the intent of allowing utilities to recover their costs to provide SOS as well as to reflect in SOS prices an analog of the cost retail electricity suppliers pay to provide their services. The components of BGE's Administrative Charge were modified and updated in Case Number 9221 by Order Number 87891 issued on November 17, 2016. Among other things, order number 87891 requires that the company collect the actual costs of the incremental cost and uncollectible cost components of the administrative charge, subject to true-up. The new administrative charge rates reflect true-ups of actual cost versus forecasted costs for incremental, uncollectible, and cash working capital costs of providing standard offer service. 
The true up of the administrative charge is expected to increase residential bills by about three cents per month. Staff has reviewed the filing and BGE's calculations and their resulting tariffs and finds them to be accurate and in compliance with order number 87891. Staff recommends that the Commission accept for filing Baltimore Gas and Electric Company's revisions to its administrative charge with an effective date of October 1st, 2018. Thank you, Mr. Spivak. I also recognize that Office of People's Council on um, Monday of this week filed a note preserving its um, arguments that they currently have on, on appeal. Um, I have no additional questions. Uh, do commissioners have questions? Just, just to see if staff uh, has an update on the appeal filed in the Court of Special Appeals by OPC. Uh, I do not have that Status. information. Um, I would, I would uh, check the general counsel. See, a couple of people had springs and jumped <laughs> up out of their seats. <laughs> Boing. Ms. Arsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Um, the, uh, the oral argument in the appeal was held on September 10th, I believe. We do not yet have an order. Obviously, one will be produced at, at the court's convenience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any other questions? Is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move the commission accept the tariff revisions for filing with an effective date of October 1st, 2018. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. The motion is approved. I believe that the next two two items can be called together. Item 13 is Delmarva Power and Light Company filed on May 21, 2018. It's annual report regarding the update of the purchase of receivables, POR, supplier discount rates effective um, July 1, 2018, but that date was deferred. And uh, item number 14 is Potomac Electric Power Company filed on May 21, 2018. It's annual report regarding the update of the purchase of receivables POR supplier discount rates. Ms. Groffalo, if you'd like to get comfortable, uh, the utility has, so um, <laughs> feel, feel free or, or stand at the podium, your choice. Maybe we didn't anticipate this was going to be a five minute item, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> we have enough seats for everybody. Let me just say for the uninitiated, this is a, a complicated um, topic to, to digest when it's a relatively simple con concept, in my opinion, um, calculation of these discount rates. But based on the ream of paper I have before us on the bench here, perhaps not. Ms. Croffalo, why don't you try to walk us okay. through in your presentation? This, this turned out to be more uh, complicated than, uh, than many. Um, but the PHI companies uh, have filed their annual POR discount rate filings. Um, staff recommends that the commission reject the company's POR rates and accept the rates recommended by staff. Rates proposed by the companies and by staff are set forth at page three of staff's comments. Although only the POR rates for residential customers differ, the methodology is different throughout. If accepted for filing, uh, whichever version of these rates uh, uh, you do accept uh, would become effective October 1, 2018. Uh, the filings um, present three issues. Uh, perhaps the most simple is how to accommodate uh, RM54 costs. Staff recommends that the Commission allow Pepco and Delmarva to recover the cost of RM54 from the non-residential customer classes uh, from their portion of what's been termed the Supplier Liability Fund as directed by the Commission in case numbers 9414 and 9455. This, covery should, this recovery should be based on customer counts uh, in each class in accordance with the most recent class cost of service, com uh, class cost of service study for each company. Due to the lack of sufficient money in the portion of the Supplier Liability Fund, representing uh, residential customers, um, staff recommends that RM54 funds for residential customers come from residential ratepayers as a whole in a base rate case. In neither instance should these costs be placed in POR rates. That was your decision last year. Um, and um, thus Pepco and Delmarva's proposed tariff should be rejected in this regard as it was last year at this time. The second issue 
is the issue of payment posting. A reason for the difference in staff's proposed POR rates and those of the PHI companies is staff's use of the most recent class cost of service studies for the companies. The class cost of service study includes all customers and staff believes that using this studies, or these two studies, one for each company, is a reasonable proxy for the numbers provided by the companies when estimating the uncollectibles for Pepco and Delmarva. It is staff's position that payment posting whereby utility charges, delivery and commodity combined, are paid prior to retail choice charges, which are for the commodity only um, and for those customers um, who subscribe to a retail um, provider, uh, may account for the discrepancy in collectibles between choice customers and SOS customers, and I think staff has discussed this in its comments thereby driving up the uncollectible elements of the POR rate. PHI maintains uh, in its reply comments that it is required to do this by its tariff. However, the tariff governing POR rates uh, is silent on this issue. Um, and um, finally, there's the issue of uncollected cost uh, at uh, Delmarva. For the second year in a row, the choice customers in the Delmarva service territory present extremely high uncollected cost, especially as compared with uncollected cost for SOS customers. Staff's rate is higher than Delmarva because it is not amortized in it. If you may remember last year, we, there, there were high uncollected costs and, and they were amortized over three years. So that is a factor in there, but it's, it's not the only factor as um, my witnesses will discuss. It is important that uncollectibles not be allowed to continue to increase in order to avoid a POR rate that depresses activity by retail suppliers in the Delmarva service territory. Um, and I think um, Mr. Vander Hayden uh, would like to add some detail to those issues. Sure. Uh, Mr. Vander Hayden, on, on which issues would you like to add additional detail? Uh, I'm going to uh, briefly address the written comments that the company filed on Monday, and then Mr. Uh, Mr. Hoppeck is just going to cover, uh, highlight some of the technical issues that we think are important to the Commission. Thank you. And I recognize that Risa is also a, a party to this case here. So Mr. Green, at the appropriate time, please approach when you're ready. Mr. Vander Hayden. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Phil Vander Hayden on behalf of technical staff. Uh, I'm going to address three uh, specific areas, uh, the written comments uh, the company filed, the applicability of the tariff the 2016 uncollected costs and the cost recovery uh, for any expenses that would not be included in the PR rates. So at first I just want to talk about the applicability of the retail tariff to the calculation of the POR rate. The company states it has calculated its POR rate according to its tariff and must comply with those terms. The problem with this argument is that the company applies language from a different section of, it, of the tariff than the schedule used to calculate POR rates. Strict interpretation of the tariff would not permit application of one section of the tariff to another without a reference. No such reference exists in the POR tariff that describes the use of the payment posting that's in the retail tariff. The company cites language in the retail tariff, which is between the company and its retail customers, as the reason for applying a payment posting sequence to its calculation of the POR uncollected cost component. The calculation of the POR rate is written in Schedule 3, of the supplier coordination tariff, which is a separate document which sets the relationship between the company and retail suppliers. The language from the retail tariff was used to specify how much of a partial payment would be paid to retail suppliers. And that was before the POR program was, was in place, so up till about 2010. Under the POR program, this language that's in the retail tariff no longer applies because the company, not customers, pay the retail supplier. Furthermore, Schedule 3 of the, of the Supplier Coordination Tariff does not make any reference to the retail tariff. The second issue I'd like to address is the company's comments on the staff's proposal to deal with the 2016 uncollected costs. The company argues that staff should have known the company's approach to calculating the POR costs and has no basis to review the 2016 uncollected costs that staff has raised as an issue. The company's wrong because it had the responsibility to disclose its method of calculation of the POR rates in the discovery provided to staff in the previous year. It's only until this year the company has described the means by, it by which it applied partial payments 
first to the base rates and the SOS revenue, and then secondly to retail choice revenue. On page three of the company's comments, the company states the staff has no justification other than being unaware of the company's practice of applying partial payments to distribution and SOS for the purpose of calculating the POR uncollected cost. The company states staff's ignorance of Del Mar's power tariff cannot serve as a basis for reversing the Commission's August 1st, 2017 determination that Del Marva Power may recover its 2016 uncollected costs, which total 1.4 million. The company fails to appreciate its obligation to provide full and accurate information. Staff is dependent on the company providing thorough and complete responses to discovery. In response to the 2016 uncollected costs, the company indicated the high level of cost reflected issues related to its system, Solution 1 billing system. There was no mention of how payment posting would increase the POR on collected rate. And this is further described in the uh, RR2979, which the company attached to their comments in attachment B. The third issue is just cost recovery and, and, the, and fairness to all customers. Staff's method of calculating the POR rate respects cost causation and treats both retail choice customers and SOS customers equally. Staff's proposal does not prohibit the company from recovering legitimate uncollected costs. It simply requires the company to use the appropriate recovery method, and staff is suggesting that that is not this POR rate for the recovery they're asking for. The company has proposed to establish regulatory assets to recover costs that the commission would not permit the company to recover from this POR discount rates. The company has not supplied a reason to do so. They simply ask for it. In fact, the company has not specified the dollar amount at request to be included in the asset or any of the terms describing it. So we don't have a specific amount to be established as an asset. If the company wishes to recover these costs in a subsequent base rate case, it should prepare a testimony that supports its claim in that case. Without establishing a regulatory asset, the company may be at risk that a party or the commission would object to including costs that were incurred outside of a test year. However, that would be the appropriate venue to address that issue in, in, in such a proceeding where there'd be an opportunity for discovery and cross-examination. So it, just to, to conclude, staff understands that the retail choice market is still 18 years into the restructuring. It's in a fragile condition. Delmarva and Pepco serve less than 14% and 20% of, retail, of customers on retail choice. And these figures have dropped about 1% from the same month uh, of July in 2017. Higher PR rates are not likely to encourage more retail suppliers or make rates more competitive. The Commission should accept staff's PR rate revisions and require the company to apply customer payments in a manner that treats retail choice customers, SOS customers, and suppliers equally. And I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Hoppeck just to highlight some of the important technical details. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. David Hoppeck on behalf of staff. As uh, Mr. Vander Hayden stated, I'm going to highlight uh, some important and technical details related to RM54 cost recovery, uh, the company's payment posting sequence, and Delmarva's elevated residential uncollected costs. Turning first to RM4, uh, RM54 cost recovery, the company has proposed to collect RM54 programming costs from POR rec reconciliation balances. Uh, only the commercial classes have sufficient reconciliation balances to recover RM54 costs. So the company is proposing to recover all RM54 costs from commercial classes reconciliation balances. Effectively, this uses late payment fees in the commercial classes to pay for all RM54 costs, thus providing the RM54 improvements to, residen to residential customers for free. Staff believes this violates cost causation principles and may lead to higher POR rates for the commercial classes in the future. In case 9443, the Commission was presented with the Supplier Liability Fund as a single source of funds available to pay RM54 cost. The Supplier Liability Fund was presented as the overcollection in POR. Actual over or under collection in POR is the sum of reconciliation balances from all four POR rate classes. Residential customers benefit from RM54 but have limited or negative reconciliation balances available to pay RM54 costs. The company's approach excludes RM54 ratepayers from paying any RM54 costs because the company only allocates to the non-residential classes. 
Staff recommends allocating RM54 costs in a manner consistent with the company's most recent cost of service studies. For the type 1, type 2, and hourly classes, staff's method would use these classes' positive reconciliation balances to pay these costs. For the, reconcili uh, excuse me, for the residential classes, the reconciliation balance is, n is negative or insufficient to cover all allocated costs. For any remaining residential RM54 costs not covered by the reconciliation balance, staff recommends recovery from residential customers in a rate case by properly adding the RM54 amounts to rate base. Next, I'd like to turn to payment posting and uh, a comparison with how it would look under pro rata. Um, let me provide an example uh, to express our concern with how uh, they have calculated uncollected costs based on their payment posting process. Under the company's POR uncollected cost approach, a payment posting sequence prioritizes distribution revenue over retail choice generation revenue instead of applying the partial payment in proportion to generation and distribution portions of the bill. In other words, instead of doing it on a pro rata basis. For example, if a customer had a $100 bill, $50 of which is distribution and $50 of which is supply and makes a $50 partial payment, all distribution charges are paid, but all supply charges remain unpaid. The company does not subject SOS revenue to a payment posting sequence for the purposes of establishing the SOS administrative charge because the companies combine SOS and distribution in their billing system. SOS customer partial payments are allocated on a pro rata basis between SOS and distribution. The net effect of this policy appears to reduce distribution and SOS on collected costs while increasing POR on collected costs. Staff no notes that for both companies, 2017 POR on collected costs are twice as high as 2017 SOS on collected costs on a percentage basis. Distribution, SOS, and retail choice charges should be treated equally in POR rates and, excuse me, and POR rates should reflect pro rata payment posting sequence in the same manner as standard offer service. The company has indicated to staff that the Solution 1 system is incapable of calculating a pro rata amount for the POR uncollected costs without a reliable means to calculate the actual choice uncollected costs. Staff recommends using uncollected costs from the company's most recent uh, cost of service studies as a proxy for uncollected costs under a pro rata payment posting sequence. Finally, turning to Delmarva's uh, elevated residential uncollected costs. So Delmarva's 2017 residential uncollected costs, similar to its 2016 uncollected costs, are high relative to historical levels. Staff believes this is partially a result of the company's payment posting sequence, but also related to the company's attempt to target accounts with arrearages in, in excess of $5,000 for termination and improved termination procedures allowed by the new AMI metering system. To prevent a large jump in POR rates, Delmarva is proposing to amortize 2017 uncollected costs, as was done with 2016 uncollected costs. Amortizing high uncollected costs in consecutive filings may put Delmarva residential POR rates on a path for significant increases in the next few years. Higher POR rates may have detrimental impacts on the number of, uh, on the number of suppliers or choice offerings. By using the uncollected cost percentage from the most recent class cost of service study, staff avoids the need to amortize 2017 Delmarva residential uncollected costs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Good morning. Brian Green for the Retail Energy Supply Association. We submitted comments on Monday morning. Um, and I want to make a quick correction to something in the comments on page three. There's a reference to uh, $444,641. Uh, and just, uh, it's not going to change anything that's going to follow what I'm going to say today or Reese's position. I just want to make sure that on the record, the facts are right. The, uh, that number uh, should be 
one million three hundred thirty-three thousand nine hundred twenty-four. Uh, I used the amortized amount uh, instead of the full amount uh, inadvertently. So, uh, but again, that doesn't change Reese's positions. We're generally in agreement with staff's uh, positions on the three issues that uh, staff just referenced and which were referenced in the comments that staff filed last week. Um, first, I, I want to just give an overview a little bit about just how important this POR rate is to suppliers who are in the field every day, pricing contracts, soliciting customers. You know, they were trying to price, for example, a 12-month contract in January, but at some point during the next 12 months, that POR rate is going to change, which sig could significantly cut in to the margin and the pricing. So. The natural thing to do for a supplier is to bake in that risk factor that the POR rate may jump. And in the last two years, this year and last year, the proposals from, say, Delmarva were significant increases in the POR rate. And that, so you have the problem looking forward as to what will the rate be because there's this uncertainty. Then you have the problem that uh, if it actually does happen and what is that rate going to be? Uh, and what will it do to existing contracts, but also uh, it, will it cause suppliers to leave the market? Will it cause suppliers to offer fewer products in the market? Uh, you know, we're seeing an, a decrease over the last several years in shopping in the Delmarva territory. It peaked, I believe, close to 18 percent a few years ago. Now it's at roughly 14 percent. So I, I can't tell you that POR is the problem that's facilitating that, but it, it's got to be an issue, and it's got to be something that we all think about long and hard. The other problem with a, a, a constantly moving or very high POR rate and the risk thereof is that suppliers look at that territory and they say, I don't want to be there. I'd rather invest upfront market entry resources to a different jurisdiction. So you have the problem <coughs> exacerbates in that there's a potential risk factor in pricing prices that are offered, then suppliers may choose to leave the market, and then supply, no new suppliers will come into the market. So as we go forward and set these rates, I, just, I, I always like to reiterate just how important these rates are to competition in general and to individual suppliers as they plot out their business strategies with respect to the particular service territory. So turning first to the payment posting issue, so the purpose of POR, you know, when we started talking about this in 2007 and it was later implemented in 2009 and 10, was that the utilities had this uh, advantage and it, we, we, the suppliers felt like they were playing on an unlevel, unlevel playing field because the utilities could terminate for non-payment, but the supplier using a consolidated bill just got the receivable or the, the payable kick back to them and they had to use their own collection efforts. So the, whereas the utility had the threat of termination, the suppliers did not. And what exacerbated even that un, uh, unlevel playing field was that there was a payment posting system, which is the same one that we're talking about today, which favored the utility arrearages over the supplier arrearages. So you had the utility that had the threat of termination, and then someone would make a partial payment, and the utility would get paid, but the supplier wouldn't. So things got kicked back, the, the, the payable got kicked back to the supplier, and then the supplier was on his own. So POR was supposed to address all of that and was supposed to help level the playing field, and it did with respect to terminations, right, because now the utility has the receivable and the utility can threaten to terminate, and the supplier's been paid. The problem is, is that the payment posting system, which was a large factor in, the, in, in, the, in POR implementation to begin with, has lived on. And no one understood that, apparently. Certainly, RISA didn't, and staff said it didn't. I guess the utility, I shouldn't say no one, because I guess the utility did. But so it is, we, we don't, we're unable, <coughs> as far as I'm aware, as far as from reading all the, the utility and the uh, filings and the data responses and staff's filing, we're unable to quantify what the amount of the problem is and what would the rate be where there not have been this payment posting system in place. So when RISA looked at all this, we felt like staff's proposal was reasonable, that uh, to use uh, the, the, the 2.5 or roughly 2.5 percent 
going forward and, and on this particular um, this particular filing. So, and we also analyzed the tariff just as staff did and uh, Mr. Van der Hayden discussed. So, uh, and there is nothing in the supplier coordination tariff that addresses payment posting. So, uh, we thought this issue was behind us and then it reared its head that actually is not only behind us, but it is, we've been dealing with it unknowingly, or not dealing with it, but it has existed unknowingly for the last seven, seven or so years. So, um, and the, the other final thing on payment posting is that uh, we are concerned what happens with other utilities. We don't know at this point if BGE is utilizing the same payment posting system for gas and electricity or for what Washington Gas is doing for their gas program. So uh, so this is a big deal, not just for these two utilities, but for all of the POR systems that are in place right now. As, as far as the high Delmarva uncollected costs go, um, we, you know, we, we look at it, we understand, and we appreciate what Delmarva was trying to do with the three-year amortization of the 2017 costs overlaying those on top of the amortized 2016 costs. We, we appreciate that. It actually gets to a uh, discount rate for this year, if adopted, that would be lower than what staff was proposing at 2.9% at versus roughly 3.3%. Uh, our, our concern, and the members of RISA have talked about this quite a bit, is that, as Mr. Hoppick mentioned, once you get to next year and the year after, you, you're you're compounding the problem. And we, obviously, we don't know what the costs are going to be in the next 12 months, but uh, you're still going to have two amortization periods running. And according to staff's analysis, you're going to see large jumps next year and the year after. And Reese's preference, although the, the, you know, we're talking about under staff's proposal, what would be approximately a 93% increase in the current discount rate for residentials for Delmarva. That hurts, but we're trying to f figure out the long term and what works. How do you get this program back in place so that it works for the long run and not just for the next 12 months? So we were inclined to come out in agreement with staff's proposal and how to treat the uncollected costs. Um, we think using the class cost service study is, the re is an extremely reasonable way to do this uh, in a in given the payment posting issue and the high uncollected cost issue. And then uh, finally, on the RM54 cost issue, you know, we were here last year and the commission, in, in my view, in no uncertain terms in the August 1st, 2017 letter order, uh, uh, rejected the utility's proposals to put those RM54 costs into the purchase of receivable discount rate, said put it in base rates, uh, and you can also, to the, and I'm paraphrasing obviously, but told the utilities, you can also come forward and give us a proposal to use the over-recovered funds. But the way I read the order was that that presumed that for that particular class, there are over-recovered funds from which to draw. And they're not there for residential, for PEPCO, or from Delmarva. So uh, we're inclined to agree with staff's, not we're inclined, we have agreed with staff's uh, proposal to take the residential portions for each and put those into base rates, which where we, where we think they belong. Uh, because as we discussed last year, uh, RM54 costs uh, are extremely important consumer protection issues, especially the three business day switching, uh, and all customers are benefiting from those costs. So those are a very high level overview of Reese's comments. Um, happy to answer any questions. Uh, as long as I don't have to dig too deep down into the math weeds, I'm, I'll do the best I can. So. Thank you, Mr. Green. Um, a lot of arguments to respond to uh, counsel for the utilities, uh, if you can make an appearance. Uh, sure. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Matthew Seegers appearing for Pepco and Delmarva. Appearing with me is Ms. Susan DeVito, uh, the PHI Director of Pricing and Regulatory Services, who is my subject matter expert. Um, as, uh, as staff and RISA have indicated, the, the, the PHI companies did file comments on Monday. And as we explained in our comments, staff's proposed revisions to the Pepco and Delmarva Power POR rates would have the effect of unjustly preventing the PHI companies from uh, recovering an approximate total of over $1.6 million through the, the POR discount rates. 
Now, it's worth noting that nowhere in staff's buck sheets did it make clear its position on whether the PHI companies should be able to, to recover this amount, or if so, how the PHI's uh, companies should recover it. Now, as you've heard, um, staff and RISA's opposition to the PHI company's proposed PLO rates is based in large part upon their disagreement with the company's payment posting sequence. However, uh, notwithstanding staff and RISA's disagreement with this payment posting sequence, the PHI companies described in our comments how this sequence is specified in our, in our commission approved publicly available tariffs, which have the force of law. In other words, the PHI companies are obligated to comply with this payment posting sequence, and neither staff nor RISA have demonstrated that we have any authority to use any alternate pay payment sequence. In addition, as you've heard, staff is seeking to reduce Delmarva Power's 2016 total uncollected costs in the same manner as the 2017 uncollected costs. Notwithstanding the fact that the Commission has already authorized Delmarva Power to recover its 2016 uncollected costs, over a three-year period. But once again, the only justification that staff provides for its proposed reduction to the 2016 uncollected cost is that staff was unaware that Delmarva Power was using the payment posted system that has been specified in the Delmarva Power tariff at least since August 16th of 2007. Staff has not presented any new facts or circumstances that were not present last year when the Commission uh, authorized Delmarva Power to recover its 2016 uncollected costs. And I do have to take issue with the implication of staff that we were somehow hiding this, this payment posting sequence. Nothing could be further from the truth. It was, it's, it, it's, it's specified in our tariff, which is on file with the Commission. That in and of itself is notice. Anyone who wants to take a look at our tariff can go onto our website. So we, I, I don't see how anyone can make a claim that we were hiding this payment sequence. Um, and therefore, it would be improper for the Commission to accept staff's proposal to reduce Delmarva Power's 2016 uncollected costs in the absence of any new facts or circumstances. Um, I would also like to uh, re respond uh, to a comment made by staff that um, we had indicated that our solution one system would not be able to do a pro rata payment. That is actually not true. We are still um, looking into that, but we did not indicate that it would not be able to do so. But putting that aside, we should be required to do so. Um, as you've also heard, staff opposes the company's proposal to recover RM54 costs from existing Type 1, Type 2, and hourly service reconciliation balances over a two-year period because it results in no costs being allocated to residential customers. However, as the PHI companies indicated in our comments, our proposal to uh, not to allocate any RM54 costs to the residential class is consistent with this commission's determination in order 88432 that the supplier liability fund should be used to pay these costs. Because the companies do not have a supplier liability fund for the residential customers, these costs were allocated to the other classes that do have such monies available. In the event that the Commission agrees that a portion of the RM54 costs should be allocated to residential customers based on customer counts, then the Commission should permit the companies to recover such amounts through our POR discount rate for the reasons that we specified in our comments. In order to mitigate any impacts for recovering the residential portion of the RM54 costs through POR rates, the companies are willing to amortize these costs over a three-year period. In conclusion, the companies request that the Commission requ uh, reject staff proposals and accept the company's 2018 POR discount rates as proposed. In the alternative, if the Commission elects not to accept the company's proposals, then the companies will be willing to extend the amortization period for recovery of 2016 and 2017 uncollectible costs. Finally, in the event the Commission determines that any of the historic costs comprising the com company's proposed POR discount rates should be recovered through base rates, then the companies request that the Commission explicitly grant the companies authority to establish regulatory assets for these amounts so that the companies may have the opportunity to seek recovery for these amounts in our next base rate cases. And we are available if you have any questions. Mr. Singer, sure you, you just will. offered an alternative uh, position here where you would agree to amortize some of these costs mm -hmm. over a longer period. Mm -hmm. That's can, correct. Can you explain what that is? Sure, and I'll defer to Ms. DeVito to give you the details of that. Good morning, Commissioner and or Chairman and Commissioner Susan DeVito for PHI and Delmarva and Pepco. 
So what we would um, offer for the PORs, we would offer a, an extended amortization. Instead of amortizing the uncollectible costs over a three-year period, as the Commission um, approved last year for the 2016 uncollectible costs, we would amortize that over four years and then take this year's uncollectible costs and also amortize that over a four-year period. Just in order to, to reduce the impact, we are aware you know, that the discount without doing that would be rather high. We also looked at um, and tried to forecast what our 2018 write-offs would be for the POR. And currently, again, I have actuals through August and then forecasted the rest of the year would be approximately 888,000. So much less than the other years. But I think what, what we need to look at and what um, staff kind of, in my mind, kind of looked at the high years, they didn't look at o the overall POR program from the beginning. If you look at write-offs from the beginning of the POR um, till current through December of 2017 for both distribution, <coughs> SOS, and third-party suppliers, the write-offs are consistent for in, on average. So overall, distribution write-offs in that period were about 2.17%. For SOS, they were about 1.93%. And for third-party suppliers, they were about 26 So my, our proposal is staff's only looking at the years that are high. They're not looking at the whole overall for all those years. And I think you really have to look at the, the entire period, not just take the high periods. There were years that the residential customers paid zero discount rate. So understanding that, that the, the sensitivity around a high discount rate, Delmarva and Pepco are willing to amortize some of those costs over a longer period of time. Are there more than one amortization schedules currently in, in place? Are they running concurrent, or, or are we just talking about one amortization period? Well, what we would do is there would be two, am two parts that would be amortized. The 2016, which is currently amortized per the order last year, right? That, that's over three years. So we would extend that to four years. And then we would take the 2017 expenses and amortize them over four years. So there would be two running concurrently. Okay, thank you. How, how does staff respond to this alternative set forth by the companies? Uh, Your Honor, I think the, uh, the, the, certainly that would address the ability to lower that rate going forward. Um, we have not tried to predict what uncollected costs will be going forward. Uh, Ms. DeVito you know, notes that it's only going to be 800000 next year. So there is some perhaps benefit to, to spreading out what, needs, what has been already incurred and needs to be, be collected. And I think that's, that's a good idea. That does not potentially address the other issues about the equity or the fairness. Uh, let me ask one more question, and then uh, I'm sure the commissioners have other questions. Mr. Seegers, you argue that according to the payment posting priorities, the, the schedule of payments, mm -hmm. which make the utility whole first before the retail supplier whole first for arrearages and then for current charges. Mm -hmm. You say that you're following your currently effective lawful tariff. Staff argue that you're looking at the, a different section of the tariff that should not be applied to POR rates. How do you respond to that argument? Well, I don't see. Um, it's my understanding that staff's concern is that we are favoring our, S, our distribution and SOS customers before, um, before retail suppliers. Which is true. But is it that is, correct? That's, well, that's correct. Yes, yes, okay. it is true. And if you look at the, at the pages of our tariff, which we included as attachment B in, um, in, uh, in our comments, that is, in fact, what we are required to do. And the language specifically applies to customers who are taking both SOS and retail choice. So I don't think that staff would disagree with the words on the page, but I believe their argument is that the tariff that you're looking at, those tariff pages, are not applicable to the POR rate. So let me let them respond, and then perhaps you could provide okay. your response. Mr. Van and Hayden, you made that uh, allegation. Is that true? Yes, yes, Your Honor. The, uh, the retail tariff, as I said in my comments, th that applies to the utility and its customers. This language uh, would talk about if a customer makes a payment, part of the payment would go to the utility, part would go to the retail supplier. There's no link between this payment posting schedule, which was in place before POR existed, and the, P and the supplier coordination tariff, which governs the relationship between the utility and the, and the retail suppliers. So it's two separate sections of the tariff that apply to different, one supply to retail customers, the other to, to, um, to the retail suppliers themselves. 
Mr. Sigurds, how, how do you respond to that? Well, I believe that what staff is alleging is that this payment posting sequence is the reason why the uncollectibles that are attributable to customers who take re retail choice are higher than they would be for uh, an SOS customer. So, and my response is simply that that is what we are required to do. In terms of whether or not it could be applicable to how the, the, the calculation of the, the POR rates, that is not what I understood staff to be saying. They were, they were not happy with, uh, they were essentially alleging that, a, that retail choice customers would have higher uncollectibles because of this payment posting sequence. That's what I understood their argument to be. Commissioner Richard. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, but let me f just first ask a question about the RM54 cost allocation, probably first uh, to, to staff. Um, as, as you noted in, in Order 88432, uh, at that point, the specific language is that the supplier liability fund to pay these costs was the optimal method of recovery, recovery at this time. Um, that was October 2017, and then the same uh, uh, method was adopted for the Delmarva case in 9454, which is February of this year. So at this time, why is the staff arguing that, that we should change our, I understand your argument about the, uh, about the, the, the justice to the residential, but given that, this, that the commission has already uh, noted that, that this is a benefit, that our, uh, RM54 was a benefit to all customers, uh, and that the supplier liability fund would be a, a good method at this time to, to use, why, why should we deviate just in less than a year uh, from uh, our finding that at this time that is the best way to do it? Uh, I think the distinction is that uh, when this was considered in the previous base rate cases, it was portrayed as a, some, as a, a fund that, that did not have uh, direct, out, uh, it was not attributed to specific classes. So the issue that we're, that we're identifying here is that uh, there are, the, the supplier liability fund comprises funds that are, are, are essentially left over from being collected through the POR discount I, I do understand that. So you, you think we were just misinformed? I mean, I, I, I kind of feel like we did know that there were multiple sources of those uh, liability funds and that the decision was rather than go into a base rate we would just use these funds that, uh, at this point, it was not explained to me how uh, we would be using the funds otherwise. I, I, don't, I don't recall a, a discussion of, of, of the actual class allocations of the supplier liability funds in a manner that allowed you to view the amounts that were available to recover the cost of, of each class as RM54 costs. The residential class uh, allocations to RM54 are larger than the commercial classes, and yet the commercial classes are the classes that have the larger balances. That discussion did not appear, from my understanding, in the records of either of those cases. Yeah. Okay, so Good. just the fact that at the high level, we just said this was the optimal method of recovery at this time. You, you think that the, our record should have acknowledged that uh, the, they were coming from different classes? I, again, I'm, there, I'm not fully understanding why staff is Mr. Hoppe, taking you want to take a Yeah, if, if I can add. Um, so we specifically uh, confirmed that the record in case 9443 mm -hmm. simply said what the total supplier liability fund was at that time. It did not say this much is from type 1, type 2 hourly. Um, and in subsequent data requests to the company, uh, they stated when they were referring to the supplier liability fund in that case, they were only referring to type 1, type 2, and hourly. However, that information was not conveyed, uh, again, as part of the record at all during that case. It was simply presented as one lump sum that was greater than the cost of RM54. Okay, well, thank you for that answer. Um, I guess the other question is, is about this, uh, the, the, the posting sequence. If I'm hearing you correctly, the, the, the only time this really would have an impact is if we have a large number of, uh, or just even a significant number of customers who are paying only partial payments. Is, is that correct? I mean, if everyone is paying in full, are they paying zero, uh, then wouldn't, wouldn't both retail and the non-retail be impacted at the same 
I, I think you have I think you have the right of it, Commissioner. The uh, the part the payment posting sequence only comes into play if a customer makes a partial payment. Okay. So if a customer pays absolutely nothing, then there's nothing for either SOS retail choice or for base revenue to recover. If they pay 100%, everyone gets paid their billed amount. And if it's only when there's less than a full payment. Okay, so I just just want to make sure we're we're identifying the correct problem here. I mean, obviously, there's a, a real problem that appears uh, on the eastern shore as far as getting you know our, uh, uh, collectibles. But as far as looking at this uh, this posting sequence, is is that is that the real issue? I mean, do we have data that says we have a large number of partial payments that are coming in on the eastern shore, and that I should just say Del Mar, but DPL. Uh, that are coming in and it is having a, a, a real impact. Do we have data? You know, is it distorting this, this, the POR? I just, again, just want to make sure we're looking at the correct issue here. I'm, I'm going to let Mr. Hoppeck answer that, but my understanding is we have not drilled into the level of looking at the proportion of bills that are paid on a partial pay basis versus complete versus, you know, no payment at all. Yeah, so um, I don't have anything to add to what Mr. Vander Hayden said on that. So yeah, we do not have specific data saying how much of arrearages that become uncollected costs or arrearages where there were zero payments made versus, you know, people were paying some over time and then still got cut off at, at some point. Okay. Yeah, I guess the concern I would have is if, if we're identifying this, it sounds like it's somewhat theoretical uh, as a p potential solution. Um, and not knowing this, in fact, is, is what the problem is. So um, am, am I correct that we really don't know exactly to so the extent that if, if we resolve this allocation issue that that would... If you resolve the allocation... The poor uh, calculation problem. You would, you would require that information to, to be tracked separately because you'd have to assign the dollars correctly, and then you would have more information. But, but uh, I think it would take... Uh, almost a bill level audit of, of payments to identify of the retail choice customers that are making payments, um, what percentage of them are in full, and you would probably have you know, s to analyze individual bills to do it. Okay. All right, um, may, Mr. Chairman, I may have other questions, but I'd like to let my colleagues get in on this. Mr. O'Donnell. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just a couple comments. One, I, I think we should remind ourselves that the economic conditions that exist on the eastern shore are um, markedly different than they are uh, throughout the rest of the state, one. Uh, two, it is my belief that um, uh, great minds often tend to think alike, Mr. Chairman, and you asked both of my lines of oh. question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to do that. Uh, uh, Commissioner Linton. Well, thank, you. Right. thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, <laughs> excuse me. I had. Um, Wanted to make sure I, I clarified a, uh, uh, a some to some of the background as to how this uh, the uh, purchase of receivable uh, and and specifically the payment posting is, is being done by the uh, by the utility company. So I just wanted to make sure that that uh, I was clear on that. Uh, so I, let me say what I think it is, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong on it. Sure. So when the payment posting priority is used for a partial payment. Mm -hmm. uh, the money is first, uh, let's say we'll take it as, as the first month, first payments are there, you've purchased a supplier receivable. So you have the utility commodity there, you have the distribution and, and all the other fees that the utility would charge, uh, you have the supplier commodity. Mm -hmm. So the, par the money is paid first for the utility commodity and then the supplier gets whatever is left from the purchase receivable. So in, year, in month number two, you have another round of utility charges and you have some leftover supplier commodity. Uh, so we'll call it the older supplier commodity. Mm -hmm. And you have the new supplier commodity that's been purchased. So how is the, pay the partial payment applied during that kind of situation? I'll respond to that. Um, so what would happen is it's going to go to the oldest arrears first. So the mm -hmm. supplier commodity in that scenario, the first month supplier commodity would be the oldest arrear. So it would apply the, the partial payment to that first. Then it would go to the newer arrears, the, the utility commodity, then the supplier commodity in the current. Okay, so, so, so it's really based on the, the distribution, SOS, third party supplier, but it's also based on the aging. So whatever's the oldest is going to be paid first. So the partial payments will go to the oldest supplier commodity 
before it goes to the new utility charges? Yes, okay. that's correct. Okay. And just to clarify, Commissioner, if I'm understanding your question, in your scenario, would the supplier rearage, if that would be the only thing that carried over from the first month, then under our tariff, yes, Ms. DeVito is correct, that would be the first the first thing that would be paid. Mm -hmm. If there was a utility of rearage, that would be the first two to get paid, and then the supplier of rearage. <coughs> Excuse me. So the uh, utility of rearage uh, and the new utility uh, charges, they're not both paid at the same time. No, no, no. It, it, the first is the utility arrearage, and then it's the supplier arrearage, and then it's the utility current charges, the supplier current charges, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Okay. But the arrearages for both the utility and the supplier are paid first. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Herman. Uh, let's... Um It, let me start, Mr. Hoppick. If we were to adopt the staff recommendation on the RM54 costs, would mm. we have to create a regulatory asset for those costs that were not being recovered? Uh, I do not believe so. Um, previously, uh, in case 9443, they were part of rate base, the RM54 costs. Um, when you issued your letter order, uh, excuse me, when you issued your order, um, saying to collect it from the supplier liability fund, it was removed from rate base, so I would assume it would be put back into rate base. Right, but if it's put back in rate base and if it's not in the test year, does it, does it not um, need to be a regulatory asset? I, I, um, I Your Honor, I, I, I think uh, the any amount that's not paid through the POR rates but is uh, a utility uh, receivable uh, should be paid somehow. We're not saying that in, in a regulatory asset where the interest rate is the same as in the POR rate, which is the um, r rate of interest for deposits, uh, would be appropriate, and staff does not oppose that. We simply meant to say that we don't have uh, sufficient information to make a recommendation on that right now because we don't know the amount the exact amount that okay. would go in there okay but you're not saying that it wouldn't be recovered you're saying it would Correct. be recovered you just don't know how much it would be and if that were the way then the company could come back and say this is how much it's going to be and ask for permission to create a regulatory asset that's correct okay just wanted to be clear so I also want to be clear um, with staff that what you're, you're not suggesting that we change the payment posting. What you're suggesting is that we change the way we calculate the POR rate. Is that correct? We're, we're suggesting that the application of partial payments would be done on a pro rata basis and not So you are suggesting posting. that we change the tariff language and that we change the payment posting. Is that uh, correct? We're suggesting that there isn't tariff language in the supplier coordination agreement or, that, or supplier coordination tariff that uses that payment posting. Uh, it would probably be appropriate to establish some language that described precisely how that was done for partial payments for the purpose of calculating the uncollected cost. So you're saying, but again, you're not suggesting that we change the way we post payments. You're suggesting that we change the way that we calculate the POR discount yes. rate. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so we're not, you're not suggesting that we change the tariff. I, I think they are, Commissioner Herman. Um, I'm confused because yeah. I, I'm, I'm sort of trying to figure out whether you are or you aren't because suggesting that we change the payment posting sequence. If I could interrupt, Mr. Vanderhaden, I believe that you're advocating for a pro rata um, allocation of these POR rates as opposed to these various priorities. For the purpose of the POR rate, yes. Okay. <laughs> Well, you just you just think you just did it again, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Vanderhaid. You said for the purposes of the POR rate, we're not changing the way we ch would they take the money. We're changing the way we calculate the POR discount, not the way actual payments are posted, but the way when you calculate the discount rate, how you divvy up the dollars that were received. Is that correct? So I'm I'm having difficulty separating those two things. Uh, in the the manner in which the company is is identifying the uncollected cost for the purpose of of calculating the POR rate. They're applying a payment posting sequence. We're suggesting they should not apply that. They should use a pro rata method. 
So, Ms. Garofalo, help me out. What are we? What are we? What are we doing here? Are we suggesting a change in the calculation of the POR rate, or and a change in the payment posting sequence, or just the first one? I think that what we're um, we mean to propose is that to the. I think we want the payment posting to be something on the order of either pro rata or all generation is posted together so that there's not a preference for the utility um, uh, receivables because it, at this point they're all re utility receivables whether because they've been purchased uh, from the supplier. Uh, so I think we are proposing a change in the tariff and that tariff and that tariff that change would um, then travel over to how purchase of receivables is calculated. Okay, and um, do you know whether uh, BGE has the same payment posting in their tariff? It is not in their tariff. It is not. Do you know if they use that same payment posting sequence? We're 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 not. We have. Yeah. Have, yes, they do. They do. Okay. Yes. yes um, and what about Smeco? Do they use the same payment posting sequence? We don't know. We don't know. You don't know. Okay. So my next question is, do you, um, do you believe that the payment posting sequence may have a public policy uh, implication that perhaps, uh, you know, should be considered in something other than, you know, one company's or two companies' POR uh, proceeding? I, I would say where other parties, you know, for example, I see People's Council is standing up <laughs> where other parties such as People's Council and, and other entities might have a uh, want to have a voice in that. I, I would just say for, on, on our part uh, that the payment posting sequence is not in, in the COMAR if you're suggesting that perhaps a rulemaking. It, there was a, originally a payment posting sequence in COMAR that addressed how customer payments were, were handed between uh, the retail supplier and the utility. Uh, that was that section, from my understanding, was removed when we did RM17 and implemented the POR rates. Uh, there is not, I think, a at the time we developed the POR rates and the schedules within the supplier coordination tariff. There was not a need that folks understood to define precisely how the POR uncollected costs so was 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 developed. Um, you know, many cases. Uh, rates in a tariff are just the rate and there's not a whole lot of uh, I guess formulaic language in there that describes precisely how it's done that it, there is some of that for for schedule three in the supplier coordination tariff but uh, I think when choice was developed a lot of the practices and procedures uh, were done through various working groups and there may not have been a desire to or a need to bring that into a kind of a broad policy rulemaking but I think I would agree that there's no reason that I can identify at this point that would need one utility to apply their their practice of, of POR calculation differently than another. Okay, and would you agree that uh, the payment posting that is in the uh, PHI tariff uh, has the effect of of the utility with the ability to disconnect? Um, getting paid prior to suppliers, as as Ms. Devito described, I mean, there's a, you know, ultimately, it may avoid a disconnection it, it down does the not. road. It, it does not. The way POR works, the utility. I'm not talking about, you know, I'm just talking about generally speaking, you know, in general, that that payment posting, ultimately. Uh, holds out to the very end for a disconnection in the utility because the utility is the only one who can disconnect, right? I, I'm not sure the payment posting sequence has any bearing on the disconnection of customers who are on retail choice, and it doesn't appear to have I'm any. Not, I'm just talking about just general policy. I, I'm, I, don't, I don't, either I'm not understanding your question, but I, I don't see how that payment posting sequence impacts termination. Okay, well, we'll ask um, uh, OPC in a little bit, but uh, I'm just going to keep going. So, um, why would you, you you have stated that you think that the payment posting has something to do with the large, uh, the 2016 and 2017 large uncollectible expense? But the payment posting's been in effect since since POR started. So why would all of a sudden now it have an effect, but it didn't have an effect in prior years? You want to? 
Yeah, so um, regarding historical data, we have a number of questions that are unanswered about the historical data itself. And I'll give you two examples. So last year, um, we were told that the reason uncollected costs were so high for uh, Delmarva uh, residential customers was because of a sub solution one implementation problem. And essentially that problem was when they were implementing the new billing system, they didn't take arrearages to write-offs for a period of time. And then they got to the point where they started doing it in mass. So they kind of delayed doing that for a while. And then during 20 year calendar year 2016, they did a whole bunch of it. Right, and so that elevated the the uncollected costs for residential um, in in Delmarva and to a lesser degree Pepco service territory. Um, one of the questions we asked uh, during uh, discovery in last year's uh, case or uh, filing was, how did this affect distribution? Did this solution one delay of write-offs affect distribution? And the company's response is, we you know like that's that's not part of this case. We, we declined to answer that. Uh, another issue is trying to understand um, how the risk of a SOS customer, for example, might be different than the risk of a retail choice customer and how that might have changed over time. So one of our questions this year was, please break down distribution write-offs by SOS customer versus POR customer, because that would give us insight into, does it look like SOS customers just as a whole tend to pay more or less? Are they more likely to, to be in arrears than a retail choice customer? They, they told us we can't calculate that data. And so, you know, looking back at historical data, there might be trends over time where retail choice customers, SOS customers were more or less risky in the past and that has changed, but there's there's no way to know that right now. So, you know, we have a number of questions about the historical data that present challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Seegers, um, mm -hmm. uh, when did the merger take place? When was the merger effective? Uh, that closed, I believe, in March of 2016. 2016, right. So we're looking at 16 and 17 are both mostly post-merger years. Is that correct? That would be correct, Commissioner. Right. And um, as part of the merger, were there potentially changes in the way the companies uh, manage their uncollectibles? I believe so. Do you... Are you able to yeah. respond to that? Yep, there's a couple things, and um, we did note this in some of our data responses uh, to to staff. Um, you know, during 2016 and 2017, uh, they, the company used um, full AMI remote disconnects, so they were using that process. Um, they were working on, on accounts with lower balances, and they had dunning changes. So they were they were working accounts faster. Previously, they would work accounts that were 180 days. Now they were moving back that to 120 days. So additionally, during when you look back at terminations, prior to 2016, terminations were around 4,000 per year. In 2016, they were 9,600. And in 2017, they were 8,800. So the company's been more aggressive in kind of working those old accounts and getting those accounts off, you know, and terminating service. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Uh, Hoppick or Mr. Vander Hayden, have SOS rates decreased in the last couple of years? Yes. So um, we have in Appendix A, and I will... I believe it is question and answer three. Oh, excuse me, that's, I'm referring to the wrong question and answer. Um, okay, please refer to page 21 and 22 in In our, which buck sheet, I'm sorry? Uh, the Demarva buck sheet, I Del apologize. Okay. 21 and 22? Yes, yeah, so this shows um, how um, Delmarva retail choice uh, residential uncollected costs uh, sometimes referred to as write-offs, have changed uh, over time. Um, so just looking at um, 
first the the, the POR write-offs you can see the big jump in write-offs from 2015 to 2016 um, and again that was explained as the solution one issue where yeah I appreciate that I'm looking for just sort of a general okay. have SOS rates increased or decreased in this time period okay so SOS rates in 2016 increased uh, from about 1.5% in 2015, I'm on the following page, page okay. 22, to about 2.9% in 2016. And then in 2017, they dropped down significantly from about 2.9% to 1.8%. I'm, I'm sorry, this, if you're looking at the chart on 22, that talk says uncollected costs as a percent of revenue. You're asking about the absolute I'm asking SOS about the rate. SOS residential rate. I, I would say they have, they have come down. They've come down. Yeah. Okay. Right. Is is it possible that um, that the fact that SOS rates have come down that that could lead to the increase in, in uncollectibles on on the retail side? Because customers have switched away from mm -hmm. SOS. I mean, mm -hmm. switched away from retail choice. Is that a possibility? Certainly, the proportion of of revenue that's being collected will have an impact. And if mm -hmm. if more customers are on are on SOS. Uh, if they have the same proportion of uncollected costs, you would see a larger SOS uncollected expense in proportion to the increasing number of sales. Right, and and that could also lead to Mr. Green's, uh, you know, increase in in customers moving to SOS. That that's also potentially accountable, you know. As a means of explaining the increase in the in the POR on collected expense? No, as a means of explaining, you know, the reduction. You know, Mr. Green asserts that. You know, customers are leaving in Delmarva service territory because I, I'm not exactly sure why. But that customer, he didn't say why. He just said that customers are leaving. But is it is it possible, you know, that that is isn't is a factor in why customers might choose to leave their retail supplier and return to SOS? It, it might. It, it's hard to make that uh, determination without knowing what the retail choice contracts look like in terms of their pricing. Although right, so I have the underlying assumption that they're all based on what energy markets are doing. So as SOS comes down, uh, retail markets tend to react more quickly because SOS contracts are a two-year contract that, that kind of, it, it works its way, energy price, energy market prices work their way into it over two years. Retail choice contracts can react more quickly, perhaps each year. And so we, I think, historically have seen as energy market costs go up, or down, the retail choice contracts that customers can have tend to respond to that more quickly. So a retail SOS is often uh, at a disadvantage if uh, it has higher price contracts built into it that take some time to roll off, whereas a retail choice contract can essentially go into the market and get a, a market price. So I think what we have seen in practice is that when en energy markets reduce their costs, the prices go down, retail choice offers pop up and become more attractive. Okay. So it's, it's probably not likely, I think, based on that, that an SOS, a switch to SOS is based on SOS prices becoming more attractive uh, because I don't think we've seen energy market prices make a significant turn upward, which would allow kind of the lingering lower cost SOS to take over. I don't think we're in that situation. Well, I guess we're we're sort of speculating, you know, on all of that for the reasons that we don't know, and the, for the same reason we don't uh, we don't know that the POR has 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 uh, has resulted in the increase. Um, Mr. Green, is it possible for suppliers to put into their ter into their contracts, uh, which <laughs> they control and the commission has no jurisdiction over, of course, uh, a, an escalation factor so that if a the, if there's a change in the commission regulation or there's a change in the POR rate, the supplier could by contract, uh, increase their um, their rate. Is that possible? Sure, that's possible. But suppliers generally, if they're going to go out and offer a fixed price contract, they like it to be, and customers like it to be, an an absolute price. For sure. The next X. I get that, rate. but it is it is right. possible. And, and there are to be, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, most contracts do have regulatory out clauses. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if this would qualify uh, in a standard regulatory out clause or not just because of rate changes. I don't think so. I think it's more really if, a, you know, for example, if the FERC would redo something with capacity that caused things, you know, redo a tariff or something that caused things to filter down to change a lot of wholesale pricing issues, then you could 
potentially pass that through. There were some issues on that several years ago in other jurisdictions. But uh, you know, generally speaking, like I said, suppliers like to offer. If they're going to offer a 12-month fixed-price contract, they don't want it to be. They, you know, fixed means fixed is what they like to say. So they don't want it, the possibility of changing just because uh, Delmarva's uncollected costs might be high, or because the payment posting system is a bit out of whack, or something else comes up that's no one's fault. Uh, and I don't mean to point fingers here, but they, they, they don't. They just don't like to do that. That's, right. You know, suppliers generally do not like to do that. Can I just add one thing while we're? One second. Please. Do you, Mr. Green? Do you um, do you know in terms of suppliers in Maryland what kind of? I mean, do they have any incentive in your view to do credit checks on the people that they sign up because because of POR they get paid a hundred percent? So do they? You know, do they or? Uh, you know the hunt uh, minus the POR discount. I apologize. They get paid, um, and and don't have any collection costs. So is there an incentive for suppliers to uh, to do credit checks and that sort of thing? All right. I think I've actually asked that years ago and got some different answers from some different suppliers. But the overall opinion, the general opinion, is that you know one of the benefits of purchase of receivables was that it lowered suppliers' costs because they didn't have to do credit checks. And they were basically utilizing or, or going after the same subset of customers that were currently SOS customers, convincing them to come over, presumably if they were concerned about lower rates at a lower rate, right? So uh, th there's no requirement, and, and most suppliers will likely tell you that there's one benefit of POR is that they don't have to do the background, the, uh, the credit check, because they're getting paid. And, okay. and that's, you know, that's it's the same subset, and that, that's one of the benefits of why I think POR has helped jumpstart many markets is because suppliers are able to go and market to uh, anyone as opposed right. to uh, weighing down the process and increasing costs with background uh, credit checks. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry. You've been standing there so patiently. <laughs> I'm, you're probably tired of standing up. So. Uh, Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Jacob Auslander on behalf of the Maryland Office of People's Council. Uh, we did not file a comments uh, in regard to uh, either of these uh, issues. I did want to uh, uh, make some comments, though, based on what was said here today. Uh, and I think that uh, OPC's position is that to the extent that any decision today would have um, lasting effect uh, on either a company or more broadly on electric utilities as a whole, we think that uh, there could be some process problems, um, you know, to the extent that uh, the decision today is going to uh, eventually bind BGE e or uh, Smeco, uh, Potomac Edison, uh, other companies. Um, we think that uh, it might be preferable to um, proceed in a generic proceeding that would apply to all of those uh, companies. Um, I also think that um, based on SAS presentation today, um, you know, while they've made a number of good points, I think that there are some questions outstanding as to. Um, you know, whether the approach that they're advocating for uh, in uh, this year's uh, discount rate is going to be uh, applicable in uh, future years or whether a different approach, um, you know, might be warranted. So uh, outside of that, uh, we, we don't uh, take a, a position on, um, you know, wh whether what uh, Risa and staff have suggested is, um, uh, is advisable, uh, except to the extent that, um, any decision made today might have lasting effect uh, outside of th this year's uh, POR discount rate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, quick, people's, oh, quick question for People's Council. Do you, do you know or have you thought about, do you have an opinion um, as to um, whether or not the tariff oh, uh, is as the company reads it or is as staff and, and, and Risa reads it. I, I haven't uh, you know, fu fully uh, finished my, my uh, train of thought on that. I, I think that uh, what, um, what Delmarva and, and Pepco are saying is probably accurate to the extent that the uh, tariff provisions on customer uh, payment posting uh, is explicit and I think would, would I, I don't know that I agree with the um, assertion made by staff that 
uh, the supplier coordination tariff would have to incorporate that payment posting. But, but I also agree that what staff and RISA have observed is maybe perhaps an unintended consequence or a, a gap in thinking. And that could be due to the fact that the payment posting uh, provisions predated POR and there might have been some confusion or uh, just a lack of, of inquiry into what effect that payment posting uh, regime would have in a POR world. So I, I think that it certainly warrants a, a, a closer look, but I, I do believe that it, it might be more advisable to do so uh, if, to the extent that the utilities are all going to be operating under the same rules, which I think is, is probably what, what the commission would intend, that it might be preferable to uh, proceed in a generic proceeding where all of the utilities would have uh, an opportunity to be heard and, and present uh, evidence and argument. I, mean, I, I believe staff, if I understand them correctly, is saying that the supplier coordination portion of the tariff is silent on the matter. I think that that is correct, and, and uh, I reviewed the uh, sections of the uh, uh, tariff that were included, and I do agree that it does not explicitly talk about uh, uh, cu uh, customer uh, payment uh, posting. Thank you. Here. I, think, I think we've developed the point that um, the tariff may be, at a minimum, ambiguous on, on this point. Uh, Chairman, may I? I'm sorry. May I, may I respond to a couple of things that I've heard in the last several minutes? And Briefly, I'll, Mr. I'll Green. be as brief as I can. Um, first of all, I just wanted to point out that uh, we appreciate, again, Delmarva and Pepco's willingness to work through this and to find uh, rates that are, uh, allow for competition to thrive and customers to benefit. Uh, we, we heard for the first time today the uh, amortization proposal from PHI, the four years from last year and the four years from this year's uncollected costs. Uh, I, we're not in a position to support that today, but I'm not in a position to oppose it either. So I don't know the math on it. I don't know what it means for this year's rates or for the potential spikes or decreases in next year's and the year after. So we're willing to consider it and look into it, but I just wanted the commission to know that uh, having heard it for the first time, we're just not in a position to comment on it. And then second is um, Mr. Oslander's uh, proposal for some sort of generic proceeding. I, I think I, I you started this part of the meeting with saying that this is supposed to be simple and on its face it looks really simple, but the last couple of years it's really been anything but. It's been extremely complex. There have been all kinds of issues that have come up, uh, and we find ourselves, I think all stakeholders, uh, committing a lot of resources, the commission, the staff, the utilities, the suppliers, uh, every year in addressing these issues for each utility. Uh, I. I don't know if a generic proceeding is the right way to go, uh, but certainly I think more discussion needs to be had among the stakeholders about how to simplify this. And uh, you know, we, we have these various issues, some that happen every year and some that are one-offs, and we, we sit down and try to, we don't really sit down and try to figure out how to solve it for the long run. So perhaps some sort of, um, I hesitate to say the words, and, and I shake when I say them, but working group might be, uh, or, or a meeting or something of the utilities in Maryland with the, with the other stakeholders might be, might, I think we might have reached a point where that is necessary. And, uh, so, and then the final point is, I, I don't think anyone here today disagrees that the payment posting system gives a preference to utility charges over supplier charges. Uh, I think staff said that in the comments. We agree with staff. I heard Mr. Seeger say it earlier. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Herman, you asked about a policy on that issue. And I think it's more of a statutory policy. Because as we referenced in our comments on page 5, um, you know, Section 7-505B3 of the Public Utilities Act specifically prohibits a utility from giving undue or unreasonable preference in favor of its own electricity supply or other services. So we read that to mean that if there's a billing posting payment preference to a utility charge over a supplier charge, that's inconsistent with the statute. And so uh, I think that definitely needs to be addressed either with respect to this filing or going forward or at some point in order to treat everything equally as staff suggests. And that's all I have. Mr. Green, um, the filing made by the PHI companies were made back in on May the 21st. Has RISA had any conversations with uh, PHI prior to today? I, uh, yes, I spoke with uh, Mr. Seegers once or twice, but nothing. Nothing towards nothing, settlement. 
discussions. Right. Nothing. I mean, uh, let me just say, at this time last year, uh, going into the hearings last year on, on the rate that's currently in effect, we had a lot of discussions, a lot of conference calls to try to get to the bottom of certain issues. Hasn't really happened this year. Um, I have had some uh, many discussions with staff, but not so much with the utilities. Okay. Well, I, I would always encourage um, discussions outside of this hearing room and even outside of the context of the working group. We have a lot of working groups uh, underway right now. I think there's only so many that we could bear. Um, Mr. Chairman? I, I, I apologize for interrupting. Um, just to, to quickly res to respond to the first point that Mr. Uh, that Mr. Green said, he, he indicated that Risa, understandably so, would not be in a position to comment on our uh, on our position to increase the the amortizations from three to four years. But it, um, we are able to to, to provide some actual um, d d dollar amounts or percentage amounts in terms of what that would mean. So I, I just wanted to see if we could go ahead and provide those. On the record now? Yes. Okay, yes, please please do and we'll move along. Sure. I, I did an estimate um, based on if we extend if we kept the three year amortization in place and extended the which was last year's amortization um, and then took this year's and amortized that over four years. And that would be approximate it's approximate because I have some other things in there that you know we haven't really finalized, but it would be around two point six percent as a, as a discount rate. If we propose to amortize last year's, go back and make that a four-year amortization, and amortize the current on a four-year amortization, that would be around 2.1 percent discount is for rate. Delmarva. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. All right. With all this information, I don't personally feel comfortable making uh, any decision today on uh, any of the issues before us. Um, the prioritization issue. Uh, interpretation of the the tariff here the issue of how we handle these uncollected costs um, and not least of which the handling of the RM 54 costs uh, that being said I personally need some additional time to to review this I would um, propose to my fellow commissioners that we suspend these two applications for a period of uh, 60 days um, to allow for additional time uh, for deliberations uh, do any commissioners ob object Commissioner Richard no, uh, I think that that is a good idea I support that um, just a clarification I'm hearing maybe some opportunity for the, the parties to get together and maybe come up with a, a potentially another path forward or maybe a different uh, methodology for uh, for al allocations and amortizations do you want to leave it open for them to to come back with another proposal maybe Risa staff and others so we can at least take care of the immediate issue and then potentially look at um, you know this this larger issue of the uh, supplier court coordination tariff and whether it should specifically uh, look at different ways of uh, you know prorating the uh, but anyway just no that that would be ideal to the extent that the parties uh, including uh, staff counsel and technical staff would be um, inclined to have a conversation with both Risa utilities and whomever else is interested to discuss these issues uh, including Office of People's Council I would encourage that um, I think that's all we could do at this point is encourage that but as Commissioner Richard noted um, we did hear some opportunities for possibly reaching settlement on, on some of these issues um, prior to the Commission taking action which I imagine if we suspend for 60 days you, you have a good sense of what timeline we'd be operating under yeah also I'd be interested to know the projections I was surprised that uh, you know in the last three years, the uh, uncollectible will jump from 4,000, and they said, I think I heard 9,600 and 8,800. Yes. So I, I'm kind of hoping that maybe we've reached <laughs> the <laughs> top here, and we can uh, <laughs> hope that this will start to come down. So that that may, uh, you know, be a good reason for the parties to talk about maybe just a an amortization process. So anyway. yes, no, that, 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 that's a good observation. Um, all right, I, I would therefore make a motion um, that we take this under advisement and suspend the. Um, the tariff filings for a period of 60 days subject to uh, future order by this commission uh, is there a second? second second all in favor aye uh, the motions are approved for items 13 and 14 thank you thank you thank you we're gonna uh, take the next two items and then we'll, we'll take a quick break Items 15 is Baltimore Gas and Electric Company, Potomac Electric Power Company, and Delmarva Power and Light Company, filed on September 6, 2018. Request for a waiver revisions to Comar 20.50.09 RM61, 
And item 16 is Southern Maryland Electric Cooperative, Inc., filed on September 14, 2018, request for waiver of revisions to Comar 20.50.09 RM61. Good morning, Commissioners, Chairman, Michael Dean on behalf of staff. Item 15 is a waiver request jointly filed by the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company, Potomac Electric Power Company, and Delmarva Power and Light Company seeking a delay in the enforcement of the increase in the level one interconnection request from 10 to 20 kilowatts. And a, item 16 is a similar filing by this Southern Maryland Electric Cooperative. Under Comar 20.50.01.02D, the Commission may waive or delay the application of new regulation in Subtitle 20.50. The Commission on September 5, 2018, in rulemaking RM61, adopted amended regulations developed by a work group for the interconnection of small generating stations. One change in the regulation increases the size of the level one interconnection request from 10 kilowatts to 20 kilowatts. During the rulemaking, it was suggested that the change in level one size have a delayed effective date to allow for the implementation of IT and process changes by the electric companies. But the commission expressed a preference instead for a waiver to accomplish this. The filings by Baltimore Gas Electric Company, Potomac Electric Power Company, Delmarva Power and Light Company and the Southern Maryland Electric Cooperative seek a delay in the implementation of the level one regulation change into January 1, 2019. As discussed in the staff comments, staff is supportive of this request and notes that parties seeking to install a generator in the range of 10 to 20 kilowatts would follow the existing procedure, which under the existing utility tariffs includes an application fee. Based upon its review of the filings, staff recommends that the commission waive enforcement of the new 20 kilowatt level one size limit for the companies set forth in the new Comar section 20.50.09.08B1 scheduled to become effective October 8, 2018 until January 1, 2019 for good cause shown. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Seems like a reasonable recommendation here. Uh, do the commissioners have questions? Uh, s seeing none, is there a motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I move that we grant a waiver of the enforcement of the new 20 kW level one size limit for the company set forth in the new Comar section 20.50.09.08B1, scheduled to be effective October 8, 2018, until January 1, 2019, for good cause show. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. The motions for both items are approved. Thank you. We will uh, take a brief break, uh, returning at 12 noon.
just the intrepid few remaining. Uh, Mr. Wallace, why don't you take a seat? Ms. Scroffalo, you as well, please. I don't expect we'll run as long as the last two items, but <laughs> you never know. Okay, I'm going to call item number 17, which is Forefront Power LLC, filed on August 28, 2018, request for a waiver from operational deadline. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Annette Garofalo, uh, on behalf of staff. Uh, this is uh, a request for an extension of the operational deadline under COMAR 20, 6204C. It's similar <coughs> to the items you've seen in the past month or so. Uh, the difference is that Forefront has asked for a day-for-day -day extension to accommodate its 224-day um, uh, period uh, due to a Caroline County moratorium that has delayed its project. Uh, under the regulations uh, in, in Comar 2062, uh, the day-for-day -day exemption is applicable to pending legal challenges uh, and utility delays only. Uh, we don't think the, uh, uh, that this qualifies as a pending legal challenge. Um, but we do recommend that the Commission waive its regulations and grant Forefront um, an extension until June 1st, thereby this would be a waiver of your regulations. Thank you. Mr. Wallace. Yeah, so the, good morning. This is Eric Wallace on behalf of Forefront. Um, Chairman, Commissioners, this, this is a LMI project in the Delmarva Power Service Territory, and what happened here was their, you know, when they first submitted their zoning application, the next day, the county implemented this moratorium. So what's different about this, um, this moratorium from the Anne Arundel County moratorium that you heard back, I think, in June is the timing, where this one happened right at the beginning of the process, whereas that one happened partway into the, um, into the process. A and so the, the, the challenge here for the, the company is that it, it set them back. They had to restart their application um, and refile under new rules that had changed while that moratorium was in effect. And, they, and so they were able to, to develop their new application and submit that in March. And so that was effectively when they were able to begin you know, this development process in terms of the zoning approval and permitting. And they've continued through that process. They expect to have their, uh, their building permits uh, this fall, either in October or November timeframe. And then they plan to begin construction April 15th and their <coughs> Um, construction contract calls for a 120-day um, construction timeline, which would take them into August. And so the, in this extension request, we built in a little extra time and, and just sort of mirrored you know, the time that they were, um, the moratorium was in effect and adding that on to the end of their, uh, the, the regulatory deadline that's, that's in the rules, allowing them a little flexibility uh, as they go through the construction process so that hopefully we can avoid um, having to come back for any additional extensions. And, and the company's invested about 800000 so far in developing this project. They estimate about another uh, $2 million, a little over $2 million to finish construction and, and complete this project. Um, and again, it's a LMI category project in Delmarva. Um, and so we think that the, the extension until mid-September time frame um, is reasonable given the circumstances and, and, and the uh, challenges that they've faced at the, at the county level with the moratorium. So you'd like another year. Uh, staff is proposing an ex waiver until June the 1st. It's your position that June the 1st is not sufficient? Yes, yeah, so the, it, starting, in, so starting in April, you know, th that is their, um, their planned start time to account for winter weather and make sure that you know, they, they can have good conditions to begin the groundwork and, and go through the construction process without weather delays um, and so you know with that um, with that 120 day construction timeline that would put them mid-august and yes yeah, so this this would just be another few weeks uh, in addition to that did the um, did your client know that the moratorium was going to take effect the very next day not that I'm aware of and I've reviewed the correspondence between them and the county I didn't see any indication there that this would be coming and as far as I as I know they, they submitted their application and then um, they got back the, the notice about the moratorium or it went into effect the following day and, and the initial moratorium was in effect through October and then in October the county extended it through December 12th 
Thank you. Uh, do commissioners have questions? Quick, quick question. Whoever knows. Um, so the moratorium is not in effect. Not currently. No. What what resulted in terms of zoning changes that we should be aware of from the moratorium in terms of these projects? What are the salient? What did they change? There were some additional. My understanding is there were some additional environmental related um, studies and 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 steps and some of the environmental mitigation requirements. I think were what changed. And I know that they did have to go back and redo their application uh, with some of those new requirements that came into effect that were developed while that moratorium was in effect. Um, and generally from talking with um, the folks that are doing the development work on this, my understanding is that it's a lot of the environmental mitigation forest conservancy work and some of the related studies um, that, that are a, a challenge that is drawing out the process um, and that's where they're spending a lot of their tr their time and um, okay and that's that's as far as so, I know so so they, they certainly didn't uh, obviously didn't stop your client from going forward with their project right it, it yeah it, it just they had to restart again you know part way through their um, you know their 18 month window <laughs> within within the uh, um, within the regulations Okay. Thank you. Yep. Ms. Garofalo, on the on the waiver that was granted for Anne Arundel County, it was uh, would September 9th, as requested by the uh, applicant, be uh, similar to what we had done in for the Anne Arundel County applicant, where they there was a moratorium. Well, it's a little different because Anne Arundel County, while it was quasi-judicial, um, this is and and not over, but we had a date certain. This is over, and in that sense, as a date certain, um, <coughs> staff cares most that you um, interpret the regulations to mean that the day-for-day -day extension applies only in the event, event of a utility delay or a um, pending legal challenge uh, if there is some reason to require additional time I think we passed we crossed that bridge last week or the week before when we went to July uh, July 1 I think so, June so you're, you're suggesting that there's a distinction between there's a difference between this situation in the Anne Arundel County Anne and Arundel County my memory is I could be wrong that they did not ask for a day-for-day -day extension they asked for or if they asked for it, they we did not recommend it, and you did not grant it. We uh -huh. we grant we granted them 30 days after the date the report was expected to come out. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Um, seeing none, um, I recognize the commission has broad authority under the general waiver pro provision to. Uh, grant these projects uh, additional time. Um, I also recognize the validity of staff's argument that a day-for-day -day waiver does not apply in, in this case. Um, thinking back to just last week, um, Ms. Groffalo, if you could refresh my memory, did we, uh, we did not give the applicant what they, the we, waiver they wanted, but we uh, reduced it to what we July 1st. We, I, I, staff recommended June 1. Uh, I think the company wanted uh, July 8th or something like that, and we settled on uh, you. You gave them till July 1. Right, and I, I noticed that a lot of these projects were trying to have the operational dates line up on the on the first of the month rather than a various random dates. Um, I would propose, um, for good cause shown providing an additional 90 days above staff's recommendation, bringing the waiver request to September the 1st of next year to begin operations. Um, that is my proposal. Um, do any commissioners object? No. Nope. OK. Um, is there a motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I move we grant the company a waiver of Comar 20 dot 62 dot 03 c until september 1st 2019. is there a second second all in favor all right uh the motion is approved thank you the Next, last I, oh you called them both already did you not no no, no. Okay. i did not 
The last item on the uh, agenda is item number 18, which is Baltimore Gas and Electric Company filed on July 24, 2018, a request for commission guidance on community solar pilot program application. Ms. Groffalo. Uh, good morning again. Uh, BGE is seeking guidance regarding the treatment of uh, voluntary withdrawal from the community solar queue, followed by immediate request for re-enrollment in the queue, thereby gaining uh, an additional 18 months, uh, which results in um, an 18-month um, extension. In some cases, uh, at no cost. I say in some cases because uh, the uh, applicant is an LMI project and would not have to um, a, uh, pay uh, uh, for on the per, kil per kilowatt basis um, for this extension. Um, so, in the in the case being considered now, Forefront stayed in BGE's queue for 10 months. After which, it requested that BGE remove it from the queue. The request was made on June 18th, 2018, and granted by BGE on June 19th, 2018. Immediately after that, Forefront requested readmittance into the Q, uh, year one queue. BGE has requested guidance regarding this matter in part <coughs> because it had been forced to deny a portion of another um, CGIS um, application due to lack of community solar capacity. Staff recommends that Forefront be required to sur surrender um, uh, its capacity, th that is the amount denied to another applicant in year one, it's 0 0.141. I have, that's what I have written down on my notes. I'm, I'm look, thinking that maybe it's 151. Um, and to require Forefront to reapply in year two. Um, and staff is recommending uh, this despite the fact that as an LMI project, Forefront needs not uh, a, a incur a fee to preserve its place. And despite the fact that at this particular moment there is space in BGE's LMIQ, um, staff believes that any other decision would needlessly and inequitably compromise the framework for approval of a CGIS and the utility's role in that framework. Um, staff relies on the utility to uh, manage the, its own queue and um, we think that it would needlessly confuse things um, to um, to grant Forefront's um, request in this uh, particular case. Thank you, Ms. Gruffalo. Council for Baltimore Gas. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Daniel Herson for BGE. Um, first of all, I think we do have an update to the immediate issue at hand here. We have worked out a resolution uh, with the developer in this particular case. I don't know if you want to try to represent, but I, after you're done, I'll come back to the, okay. the other request. So following staff's comments uh, last week, um, Forefront discussed this internally and we've also discussed it with uh, the company and with, with staff counsel and um, Forefront is willing to withdraw from the year one queue and resubmit the project in the year two queue. Um, this project is has been on hold in the BGE queue pending a decision on um, the, the guidance request. So they're not, they're not currently in the queue so if, if they were to go into the queue, they would effectively restart the clock. And we're, we're close now to the start of the year two queue for Baltimore Gas and Electric. I think mid-November timeframe is when that's expected. And there, the company is continuing to have some zoning challenges with this project. It's in the very early phases. And so they're comfortable restarting that process in year two um, to help address this concern here. And, and um, But nevertheless, the company, I think, still would like some guidance on on this issue. It, it seems like there's a gap in the regulations and in the tariff uh, on this issue and in handling what happens when a, a, a developer that's in the queue were to withdraw and then reapply, that, that scenario isn't really addressed. And so that's, I think, the reason for BGE to bring their guidance requests. And I think some additional clarity on, on how that process should work going forward would be helpful. Um, and, and some transparency for other developers going into year two and year three of this program. So, Mr. Herson, um, being that we've resolved the factual issues involving Forefront, um, can you distill what your general request for guidance is? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, at this point we don't have a position per se, but 
Uh, this is a brave new world we're operating in here with this community solar projects. And uh, although this particular factual circumstance was a, one of first impression for us, uh, you know, it's very possible that we could see this come up again. Uh, for instance, you're seeing these day-to-day uh, -day extensions for legal matters coming before us almost on a weekly basis. So you know, to the extent the commission feels like they can, uh, we'd like some guidance on how you think we should be able to handle these going forward. Um, you know, I, I certainly don't want to bring, and, I, and I, I know the developers and staff share this position, we do not want to bring matters to the commission needlessly every week. You're starting to see these on the admin dockets every week. And so, uh, you know, we want to know whether you feel like you want us to bring these to you or do you want us to try to work them out uh, on our own. Uh, even if the regulations and the tariff are silent on the issues. I know, Mr. Chairman, a couple weeks ago, I think when you were questioning um, counsel for another developer, you said, why are you here? You know, isn't the, isn't the, uh, the uh, regulation sort of self-executing? Uh, but on the other hand, I know some commissioners have asked for updates on, you know, all the projects that are going through these situations, and we want to be kept informed. So we just want to know if, if the commission has any thoughts on, on how to approach these matters going forward so that we're not burdening the commission you know inadvertently right um we cannot issue an advisory opinion from from the bench uh today obviously to the extent that the utility could apply its tariff um and its understanding of our regulations in a consistent manner with uh any developers that approach the utility for an inter interconnection agreement um I think that would satisfy the commission to the extent that you have a situation like the the one that you've had with forefront um the csec developer always has the option to file a complaint with the, the commission to bring this to uh to our attention I, I recognize that that's probably not the most satisfactory answer as you attempt to um develop your queue management practices mm -hmm. um, but it's the best that i could offer you at this at this time i want to offer some thoughts too commissioner o'donnell has some Thoughts. So one of the statutory requirements, <coughs> excuse me, on CSEG was that we report to the General Assembly uh, in a, on an interim basis the efficacy of this pilot. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have sufficient data collected to make that report because all these folks are delaying their projects for a myriad of reasons, we can't effectively evaluate the efficacy of the CSEG's pilot program. So. To be honest with you, we've seen all manner of effort to have projects waived for future implementation, and uh, I can only sp I can't speak for this commission in this regard, but I can speak for myself. Um, I think it flies in the face of what we're trying to test here. Um, so that's just the general thought I have, but I wanted to express that to you. I also do have a question. Um, and I hope that many other folks participating in CSEGS heard me say that. I'm sure they might be watching. I don't know. Um, were, were other projects displaced by this forefront project? I know we had the point one five one megawatts of capacity that was displaced for the one particular, but were there other ones that were completely bumped out of the queue in, the, in year one? No, not in this particular situation because we had available room in the uh, LMI category. So when they withdrew their request, it effectively freed up the capacity that they were seeking to cover with their project. Then they immediately, or the next day, they reapplied, which took up that capacity again. So then that locked down that category, but nobody else was in the wait. There was no waiting list. There was no queue at the time. Okay. so. So the original applications for year one only exceeded capacity by 0 0.151 megawatts in total. In that category, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. How about in other categories? Were there other categories um, that didn't yeah, have I think, capacity? I think some of the other categories, uh, there there is a wait list on um, the open category right now. Doesn't look like the the, uh, the small category doesn't appear to have a wait list. Is that right? There's no wait list on that right now. So I don't think I'm not for, I'm not aware that we had this particular type of situation arise in the other two categories. 
There's but some it could. Of, some of these developers can go in to choose and pick That's which true. category they mm -hmm. want to go into. So we we do have the potential to displace capacity, and I think we ought to. Uh, for these delayed projects, and that's part of the indigestion that they cause me. So, look, some some of the folks they can't control it. Maybe this is one of those instances. But uh, how do I know? How do I determine if we're going to keep getting these all the time? Well, that that's. I mean, you raise a good point because I know right now, um, you know, we have very little in service right now, and you know, here we are towards the end of uh, year one. Um, so it is a legitimate concern, but it also is, is the point that you make was, was why I said, do you want us to be bringing these requests to the commission every week, at the very least, just to keep you informed of what's going on, or do you want us to work them out, uh, and if, you know, some party feels aggrieved, then they bring it for you. And well, that's, I, that's kind of the quandary I'm in right now. If there's an application for waiver, and we have to address it. It's as simple as that in my mind. We can't ignore it or, or delegate that to you. We just can't. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with the with a pure waiver request, but s some of the developers argue that the the regulation on the legal challenge, for instance, the day to day extension, sh is supposed to be automatically granted by us because the regulation says shall. So, I have a feeling that a developer would not hesitate to uh, to file with us if they believe that you're applying the the rules and tariff in an improper manner. Uh, other commissioners. Just, just curious on this issue of the reallocation. Uh, how was that resolved? Is uh, are, are you going to reallocate the 0 0.151 uh, megawatts to Company A, or uh, was that? Uh, well, I guess with the developments of today, where they're going to file in year two, it's it's not necessarily a problem anymore. Okay. Uh, we can reach out to them and, and say it's available, uh, but I think that sort of took care of itself with the, today's developments. Great. And I would associate myself with uh, Commissioner McDonald's uh, remarks and, uh, and also hopefully uh, our staff and we're remembering some of these lessons we're learning in this pilot uh, re regarding our, our, uh, our regulations as they currently stand as far as maybe coming up with more realistic time uh, schedules and uh, you know perhaps other areas where there might be loopholes that were not intended so uh, that would be my only comment thanks all right uh, nothing more to discuss on this item um, is there any further business before the Commission? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned.